The Moving Iron Podcast is brought to you by these great sponsors. Are you looking to value your equipment more accurately? Target the right buyers and close more deals? Reach your ideal customer? Then look no further. Fusible isn't just about ag data. It's about action. Our best-in-class solution empowers you to value your equipment accurately, make informed decisions, and find the perfect prospects. Ignite your dealership's growth at fusible.com slash moving iron dash podcast. Out in the field, every decision counts. You wouldn't plant without testing your soil, so why would you prospect blind? Introducing EDA, your one-stop shop for ag equipment intel. EDA goes beyond specs and prices. You get deep dive data on every piece of equipment like UCC filings that help track ownership changes and uncover potential sales leads. D&B firmographics, which help you understand the financial health and buying power of potential customers. Market trends that help you stay ahead of the curve and insights on equipment demands and pricings. With EDA, you're not just looking at data, you're seeing opportunity. You find the right buyer, sell smarter, and build lasting relationships. Visit edadata.com for your free demo and unlock the power of knowledge. For over 80 years, Iron Solutions has been your go-to data source for ag dealers, lenders, and manufacturers. Get powerful appraisal and value forecasting tools that fuel profitable decisions anytime, anywhere. Get your free demo at ironsolutions.com. Iron Solutions, confidence in every click. Today, there are many ways to finance ag equipment. But nobody delivers simple, fast, or flexible financing like AgDirect. Learn more about your options to buy, lease, and refinance equipment at agdirect.com. Valley Transportation has been hauling ag and construction equipment across the country for the past 33 years. Call Parker at 800-657-4910 for all your trucking needs. At Valley Transportation, our goal is to help you reach yours. When you partner with Axon, you immediately gain access to a full range of products and solutions designed to meet the complex needs of today's grower. We carry all major brands and sizes of tires and wheels. We specialize in large diameter wheels for large equipment. We have one of the largest OEM replacement wheel inventories in North America. Known for extreme flotation setups, duals, and triples, we have wheels for all makes and models of tractors, sprayers, combines, and grain carts. If we don't have the wheel in stock, we'll custom build, sandblast, and paint in-house. There isn't a more vast inventory in North America dedicated to helping dealers move more iron. With facilities on the West Coast and in the heart of the Midwest, leverage our 230,000 square feet of indoor inventory to solve any problem a grower may have. Move more iron with Axon. At Big Iron Auctions, customer satisfaction is our number one goal. As the 40-year leader in auctions for agriculture, real estate, livestock, construction, and transportation, we are here to serve you. Big Iron will handle everything from start to finish. From meeting with you, to prepping your equipment, writing the listings, and collecting buyer's payments, let us do the heavy lifting for you. We love our customers, and we treat them like family. There's a Big Iron sales rep in your area, so let's get together. To learn more, visit BigIron.com. Moving iron in the 21st century. Hardworking people working hard for Hello and welcome to Moving Iron Podcast. I have got a return guest from a very long time ago back on the podcast, Colin. Colin heard from with Mock now at the time he was with Smart Ag way back when. Uh, he had to come come on the podcast and talked about that. That was podcast number fifty. And if you're just if you're keeping score at home, we're over I don't know twelve hundred podcasts now. So, um, Colin, it's uh, great to have you back on the podcast, man. Casey, it's great to be back. Um, it's it's amazing how. Uh you've progressed since those days and uh i'm glad to see you're still in business and it's working out so yeah it's I'm excited uh, to be back and join you for a conversation today. yeah man i'm excited about this you uh always have really innovative stuff that you're that you're doing colin every time i every time i read about you either on linkedin or some 
you know, ag based stuff that pops up and, and the company sir now is no different than that. Um, you've got a company called mock and basically mock is the components that needed to make things autonomous. So I guess I'll let you give a, a little more detailed, um, uh, explanation of what mock is and what I just gave there, but, but talk a little bit about what mock is and what you're doing. Well, so the way I explain it to my six year old is that we make machines turn into robots. And uh, that's that's the best explanation for him. He loves robots at this age, and so. Um, but in reality, that's essentially what we do on a day to day day to day basis: is we, we make robots. And uh, uh, the way we do that is we find different um, equipment manufacturers um, from all over the industry. Ag is primarily our focus, but we work with a variety of companies that build a machine, and they say, "Look, we know that our customers need." Um, to leverage this machine in an automated function to drive their their bottom line, become more efficient, become more safe. And in in most cases, um, a lot of the equipment that's being built is not always being built by massive OEMs like John Deere at the right. case. And so, a lot of the OEMs below that kind of level really do need reliable, independent technology partners. Uh, to do this stuff and autonomy is is hard it's becoming easier uh so from the time i started we we were talking way back in the smart egg days um it's become a lot easier but it's still there's still a ton of technical challenges to making something that works um reliably um and it works in a lot of different environments that customers are in and it's ruggedized enough to survive the harsh reality of um, you know a, a farm you know, or a farm field and and that's really where mock comes in so we provide not just a software solution to enable a machine to do whatever function automatically but we also provide the hardware stack required to bring the compute to the machine allow it to have that intelligence uh, to to leverage all the sensors that it needs to mm-hmm. to know if it's doing a good job safely and um, so once we understand what the requirement is from these customers, we'll typically start with a project. Um, we'll provide them with some ideas on how we can make it work, and, and we'll create a test machine and and then ultimately provide a solution that they can integrate on those machines as they go um, to the market. Yeah. So th- this is the part that I've always found just the idea of watching a machine driving the field by itself with no, nobody in it. Like when I used to watch the, the grain cart tractor, you know, and I'd see the grain cart flying around the field and it just come up and pull. I mean, it was just, it was like magic, right? It was just like one of those things like this shouldn't be doing this. There should be some, some level of, you know, there's somebody someplace with a remote control, making sure this does what it's supposed to. But it was just amazing to watch it go do what it, what it does. Right. Like you said, it's come a long way since then, right? The, the cabless tractor at a farm shows have been, you know, they've watched those, the evolution of those for the past 15 years. They never go anywhere. They never actually do anything. They just kind of sit there. But they're, but the idea of this autonomous machine going and, and working and doing its thing is always is just one of those things I just watch with, with, you know, amazement, right? This, you know, I think autonomy... 10 years ago was always a cool idea people thought about and were ready to uh, maybe go down that path. But it feels like as, as we inch closer to autonomy, where it's actually going to be a real thing, you say, do you feel like you see a level of, because I feel like this, I feel like there's a level of pushback on the autonomy level that I quite frankly wasn't expecting to see happen. I guess as you look at this and, and you kind of go through this these motions, What's some of the sentiment you're getting about that when you start looking at autonomy that way? Are you talking about pushback kind of from a, a farmer level or an end user level? Yeah. Yeah, skepticism really about, right. hey, is this yeah. actually going to create value? Yeah, can I really use this like they say I'm going to use it? Yeah, and I, unfortunately, I think um, part of that pushback is justified. You know, sure. and I, I – um, would say there's a lot of solutions out there today that overpromise and underdeliver. Mm-hmm. Uh, part of that is the messy side of innovation, where um, it's super easy to prototype something. Honestly, today there's open source software, there's off the shelf hardware. Sure. Um, in fact, one of the first uh, inspirations to me to get 
into this business was a guy in Canada who I'm sure that you've probably heard of, um, who basically took an Arduino, which is like a $10 computer board, and a Raspberry Pi, which is a $20 computer, hooked it up to his grain cart tractor and started uh, using like an open source drone controller software to uh, to make it work and uh, did it, you know. I, I think he probably spent 700 bucks on the system and was like, hey, look, I can use this. And so there's this there's this false concept out there of like, hey, we can automate stuff really quickly. And so you, you end up with a lot of early stage tech startups that come into the space um, with very lofty promises. Um, and in many cases, they've let down the customer. And I think that that's a challenge the the automation industry has to overcome to a degree. Um, it's a really big focus for us at Mock is I've been around the block, uh, you know, now at least once on this stuff. And mm-hmm. so I definitely have an eye for like what is real and what can work at scale versus what is kind of still uh, has, you know, four or five years of R&D to get to a point where a farmer can depend on it, just like he depends on his tractor on a day-to-day basis. Because that's ultimately what's happening, right? Is now, I mean, you used to depend on, you know, turn the key on your tractor every single time it starts up and it works, right? You need that to feed your cattle every day. You need it for whatever the job is. Well, now all of a sudden, if it's a computer system that's in that tractor, it's got to be just as dependable or that entire piece of machinery is compromised. Um, And so... It's also a big investment, right? right. And um, one of the things that ag doesn't always do a great job of is allowing farms and, and farmers to um, avoid risk. <laughs> if you think right. about it, there's right. a lot yeah. of risk. That farmers a lot of have. risk, yeah. Yep. Yep. And I, I think, unfortunately, a lot of times this technology risk has been shifted to the farm. And I, I think that's the wrong way to do it I, I think you need to provide ways where farms can get comfortable with this machinery um, and not take all the technology risk um, mm-hmm. especially if it's early stage tech like like what's some of the stuff that's out there one of the big differences I think in this kind of what you're talking about one of the big differences between this and say the introduction of auto guide was that auto guide was still you're still in the tractor you're still functionally having to make the machine work you got to push the buttons and you know, early days, you still had to, you know, raise implements and do those things and, and do all the stuff. Now you've got automation where all that stuff happens at once now, and you're just kind of hanging out in inside the tractor. Um, to me, I think some of the the pushback that I see from guys is that, you know, they'll never want, they don't want to stop being in the combine, right? They don't want to stop being in the tractor. That, that, the thing about farming and ranching, I think that, 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 is lost by some of the people coming into the space is that it's a lifestyle, right? It's not a job. It's very much a lifestyle. So I think when you look at some of the stuff, that's where I think some of the pushback comes from ultimately at the end of the day is that, you know, I might not be able to have to, I don't have to set my combine during harvest. Now, what what am I going to do with myself? Right. And I think there's some of that, that angst, I think that comes up there. I think a little bit sometimes when you, when you have conversations with guys about this, when you are looking at this, so, you know, John Deere's come out and said, hey, we're going to have this fully autonomous farm by 2030. Um, they start out with a uh, chisel plow, I think. That's that's something they, they start out with their first autonomous tractor. Tillage piece, really looking at your website here and kind of going over stuff before we started recording here. I mean, one of the biggest places where you've seen a lot of the autonomy really take hold and really run is, is, on, is on the orchard and vineyard side of the business, right? Obviously, that's a very um, labor-intensive uh, scenario you got a lot of people hand picking this stuff and doing those kind of things but you're seeing some machines come in i've seen everything from the the spider looking thing with scissors that picks the strawberries to the um the the nut tree um sprayer that goes in the orchard and does those kind of things um talk a little bit about that evolution and, and how mock is fitting into that well it's actually in in so far as i know today the only um space where autonomy to a certain degree is just commercial off the shelf meaning that you can go to your john deere dealership in the the valley and buy a autonomous orchard store Mm -hmm. um 
you can't go buy an autonomous tractor from John Deere today uh, to do a pull a chisel plot. I don't, I don't think it's on the market yet. Um, no. And so it, it's really an inspiration. Um, it, it's a big driving factor for part of the reason why we formed Mock. Um, and so maybe I can tie in some more background on the Mock and, and my background a little bit more. But um, the, the company that I attribute most of the success to in, in that space is a company by the name of Gus. So Gus it stands for Global Unmanned Spray System. They um, were a startup essentially um, that decided they were going to build an unmanned sprayer and really to solve their own needs. They were a big custom spraying operation and started building this and used it in their own operation for the first few years to kind of work any bugs out. But they made it sort of mainstream in that industry to use autonomous machinery. And you've seen a ton of follow-up activity from that where a bunch of other startups and other companies have also worked to embrace um, autonomy in that space. Um, so, you know, my my last company where we last met was uh, called Smart Egg. Smart Egg got purchased by um, Raven Industries in 2019. We had a product called AutoCart, which Raven then rebranded to Omni Drive, and it was uh, to do the autonomous grain cart uh, function. Now, while I was at Raven and we were working um, through a whole bunch of different uh, engineering things that some were self inflicted challenges and others were just getting it you know, into their ecosystem. But um, one of the key things that we were missing, and even later on as Raven got acquired by CNH and I had transparency into what CNH had been working on from an autonomy perspective for years, um, the biggest piece that was missing was commercial scale. And the um, value of that from the standpoint of autonomy is critical because until you get to a certain amount of scale, you really can't understand all the limitations and edge cases of a system so you've got some sort of a critical mass that's required i think to have a commercially viable product right and this so you know this big billion dollar company that i'm at um tons of engineering resources and budget focused on this problem we're sitting over here trying to figure out how to get the kind of square one and and there's this startup in in uh, california that is you know selling hundreds of vehicles um, that are autonomous and they're working. People are buying them, using them. And so, as I dug deeper, I discovered the key piece of underlying technology that they were leveraging in that space was um, from the co- from a company out of Maryland called LSA Autonomy. LSA had been about ten years in business, primarily doing work for the Department of Defense on a huge variety of different off road vehicles. Um, that the government wanted automated to do whatever. And um, they had been supplying Gus the um, the core autonomy technology for, for that system. And so as I started to understand kind of what that technology entailed um, and get to know the people at LSA, um, it really was clear to me that there was an opportunity here to take what they had done and take that to a lot of other companies in the space. Um, that we're looking for this type of technology and also bring in some really ruggedized hardware uh, to support that. And so uh, we we purchased uh, LSA Autonomy and merged um, another company out of Iowa together to form Mach. And so that was kind of the, the background and, and the basis of the core system that we have today. Um, and I think that's really the value proposition that we bring is that is that we have this hardened system that's been field tested and ruggedized across you know hundreds of vehicles and, and deployed and and um, that's that's what's really exciting to me today is to be able to expand on that. Yeah, yeah. All right, so I'm looking at your website here, and like I said before we started, got got to looking over stuff. You really kind of have kind of got a finger in about every one of the industries out there that have anything to do with machinery. You've got agriculture, construction, industrial, maritime. You got some, just like you talked earlier, you were doing some stuff with, uh, with the uh, U.S. military on, on some various things that are out there. Um, <clears throat> you know, as you look at this, there's so many 
things that, that, that are going to be autonomous in the future and not that far away. But as you look at this, a lot of, about every manufacturer is rolling out some stuff. Um, I'm looking at your, at your website here and you've got a, a Vermeer. Um, I can't remember what that thing's called. It's a bell mover. Bail, yeah. Bailhawk. Yep. Bailhawk. Yeah. There you go. <clears throat> and kind of working, working through that. Talk a little bit about how your technology is working with that. It's a great example of an OEM who came to us with a lot of technology already developed. Um, Vermeer is a big company, and mm -hmm. they have a lot of uh, really smart engineers there. And so they spent quite a bit of time developing this um, autonomous round bale mover. And uh, there's a, a few pieces of the system that they didn't have uh, solved for, and um, we were able to step in and help support them. And so... In that case, we're not we're not supplying all the technology required. A lot of it's Vermeer's technology, and it's pretty impressive what what their team did there. But um, we were able to help them with a few components of that in terms of the user interface and some of the connectivity required. <clears throat> but it's a really cool product that um, you basically just it, it, it's kind of like a set it up and walk away type product. Uh, which there's not a lot of that in the autonomy space yet. Even Gus, um, mm -hmm. we're still supervising those machines as they're in the field. Um, but this is something where, I don't know, I'm sure you've moved round bales before, but it uh, was like one of my least favorite jobs ever um, growing up and working on a farm because it's so kind of unstructured and you're always like in this decision mode about do I do I go to this bale or do I go to that bale, which is the most efficient way to do it? And it just, I don't know, by the end of the day, I, I was exhausted and felt crazy. Um, and uh, not to mention the difficulty of just, you know, not trying to bust bales and they're right. kind of rolling down the hill. It's just a sucky job. I, no one likes doing it, I don't think. And um, so anyways, you just put this thing out in the field, you, you give it a boundary and you say, pick up the bales and stack them in a line. You tell it where the line should be. And uh, so it just kind of goes and searches throughout the entire field, finds all the bales, loads them up, and then it brings them back to a to a uh, stack line, and you just they're all nicely organized there, so you can pull in with the semi trailer, load everything up, and be gone. Um, yeah. Just kind of set it up and let it work. It's, it's really cool. Yeah, yeah. They have just some of that, like again, it kind of goes back to what I said earlier. You know, you just some of that stuff looks like it. It's almost like there's a remote control guy someplace or some some someone hidden in there that you can't see doing whatever they're doing but yeah. <laughs> this machine here is i mean there's no way for anyone to set so you can't no, no one can hide in that so that's, that's yeah. very <laughs> yeah, exactly. very very impressive to watch watch these machines move so the other side of this that's i think is the hard part of autonomy just like you talked about is when we start looking at the implements and how you use the implements and the and the interface the human interface on implements is that you can look at a monitor and say hey my planter's planting or my planter's not planting, right? Assuming that the sensors are working like they're supposed to be, right? Um, you can look at different sensors and stuff on your tillage pieces and know how deep you are and all that kind of stuff. And you can really get a, you get a feel for what's going on out there. The hard part about the autonomous side of that is now you have to have to interface that with a computer of some kind that is now making those decisions based around a set of criteria that... Um, takes human reasoning to to get things pushed along when you look at stuff like and i think this is kind of that to me is, is there's two things i think that really change the speed of which autonomy is going to take place one is how fast before you have um a truly autonomous planting scenario and then the second one is when do you have a truly autonomous spraying scenario those two things to me kind of set the table that once you have those two things developed the harvest thing, I, I have a hard time believing that some farmers are just going to set back. They're going to have a hard time saying, like, I'm not going to let a machine plant my crop, and I'm sure as hell I'm not going to let a machine cut my crop, right? So those those two things are like huge things you have to overcome. But once you overcome those, I think then you can slide into some other stuff. Tillage probably would come way before anything else as far as that goes. But the two big hurdles, in my opinion, are, are planting, spraying, and harvest, right? Yep. So as you look at those things... I mean, obviously, there's machines out there now you can do it. I've watched plenty of videos watching that stuff. I mean, every every spring, it seems like there's the guy that's got the the, the seed sack uh, on the uh, the seat of the tractor and jumps out and watches his tractor do a couple loops while he's, while he's sitting there watching them. But 
from from your professional opinion and, and the stuff that you see happening now, Colin, how far away are we from the truly quote unquote autonomous form? How how close are we to that? Something like that. You know, <clears throat> those three use cases that you bring up the 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 harvesting, the spraying, and the planting are probably the most critical um, points in the in the crop cycle in terms of getting it right. There's right. just very little room for error on any of that. Right. Um, and it, you pay for it, you know, really directly if, if you screw up. And so um, I agree that those are probably going to be the last ones left um, when everything else maybe runs autonomously. Um, but there's a there's a ton of different uh, caveats to making any of those um, use cases autonomous. My guess is it's probably in the eight to ten year time frame before you see something like for the widely accepted type. Yeah, yeah, that's even really just viable commercially. Um, right. Now, in certain sectors, you can see it way fast, um, and but you're also going to start to see less about like sort of set and forget autonomy. And there's going to be a lot more um, systems that are uh, supervised autonomy, uh, meaning that instead of having um, one sprayer, put it in a field, walk away, it's going to be, you, you're going to be running three sprayers with one guy. And, or uh, th think of the, the harvesting use case is a great example um, where there's a lot of farms today that run more than one combine in a field at a time. Just, you know, especially getting these custom operator uh, crews. Mm -hmm. And there's typically um, a lack of really skilled um, operators. And so if you can take one of your really skilled operators or, or the farm owner put him in the cab of one of these harvesters, but give him control over the other two or three that are in the field with him. So he's leveraging his expertise about how to do the job really well across multiple machines at the same time. That becomes really valuable very quickly, I think. And that's where I, that's where I think you'll start to see stuff get commercialized first. It's yeah. going to be less about um, walking away from something and much more about how do I how do I leverage my skill set across multiple machines? Yeah. Oh. Yep. Um, you, you mentioned, right, we have some exposure outside of ag. And what we've seen also, which is really interesting in the construction mining space is. That was my next um, question. Yep. Is about taking, um, detaching people uh, physically from machinery, but not uh, from machinery, right? So allowing for teleoperations to happen. And that's another thing that I think you'll start to see in egg. And it might be in some of these countries like Brazil, where you have these massive fields and you have very low skilled labor, um, where you could centralize your operators into a certain spot and they're running the machinery, about a piece of machinery halfway across the country um, to do that job. And they've got all the data, just like your monitor would tell mm -hmm. you uh, today if you're sitting in the cab, they've got all the data there to make those decisions. And then you have you know, maybe one support guy that's supporting four or five different harvesters in that field. So, you know, if you throw a chain or something breaks, um, he's there to fix it. And he doesn't have to drive, you know, halfway across the country to go do that. But I think you, I think you'll start to see that. You, you see that a lot in like these mining operations where, um, you know, they, they'll have a big, they'll have a big mine site in a super remote area and they just can't find people consistently. And so they can, they go to a city center, hire some really skilled operators, you know, guys that maybe retired down in Arizona, but they're happy to sit in, a, you know, a, a operator station for several hours a day and run something in Alaska. Um, yeah. And that, that becomes, I think, really powerful. <clears throat> yeah. That was my next question. Like, in your, in your scenario there, I mean, and you kind of answered a little bit already, but looking at ag versus construction, versus industrial stuff and like those kind of things like for example a good friend of mine is in the uh the lift truck uh industry right and there's a lot of autonomy in the lift truck industry and there's inside those warehouses where they've kind of got everything mapped out and you got lift trucks running all over the place putting stuff in in you know slot a22 and they go pull something out of b3 and whatever else you know do all that do you feel like i feel like that industry 
and we're seeing it already, you know, where there, it's more widely accepted just because of the labor issues and stuff that you see coming to play there. But do you see more growth, more rapid growth with, especially on the mining side where you're doing, you know, you're, you're mining out, putting in a truck and driving the truck out or, or whatever it is that you're doing, conveyor belts or whatever it is. Do you find, do you see that being a, a way more widely accepted, maybe going to be 10 years ahead of ag? 15 years ahead of ag when it comes to autonomy and, and how those things play together. Kind of like just like, you know, a guy in a sitting in a room monitoring a bunch of monitors, kind of figuring out what's going on. Yeah, I think so. I mean, mining, I would already argue is, is ahead of ag in terms of automation or mm-hmm. autonomy. Um, and, you know, there's mine sites today that are basically running a whole fleet of autonomous trucks for haulage. And mm-hmm. uh, there's some underground autonomy applications as well. Um, the value proposition for mining is just so extreme that it's very hard to not use autonomy and stay competitive. Um, and so it's just by the nature of, I mean, I mean, these haul trucks, uh, for example, run 24 seven, they have a, uh, full-time crew per truck of five people. So they, you know, run four shifts and they, op- you know, have one guy that's, uh, rotating on and off so you, you can have a weekend um so you've got four f- or five full-time people per truck and um you do the math on that it doesn't take very long for an autonomy system to pay off um, right if you can reduce that cost and that labor dependency um so yeah the, i do think the value proposition in certain industries will drive it faster and in some cases um same thing for warehouses, right? I mean, it's it's twenty four seven kind of operation where you're constantly moving stuff, and it's a very structured environment. It's it's re- very repeatable. Part of the challenge you run into in different off road applications is where it's not as repeatable and it's less structured, and that's that's the harder part to solve for in some cases um, because you can't kind of install infrastructure um, on a field by field basis to do autonomy. You, you really have to have the intelligence side on the machine buttoned up pretty good in the sensing piece. Right. And you right. mentioned earlier, you've got to know if you're not sitting in the cab anymore, um, you have to have the sensors, uh, on the implement to be able to tell you if the quality of work is there. And mm-hmm. that's something that we look at a lot. And I think it's still an, unsolved, I think it's still an unsolved part of the equation today. Yep. And, um, I'm, I'm very excited about approaching that. I, you know, one of the things that we have invested in and we'll have a product coming out for um, the end of next year is to do um, quality work sensing for tillage type applications where you can monitor the, um, the, the job quality through all the dust and debris and me- measure residue and understand like, you know, if something's plugged or something's broken, it picks that up. So if you're not in that cab anymore, um, you still get that information and, and can make better decisions. On it. Honestly, I think you're even going to have more in it, more information and more data than you would had had you been in the cab. So right. if you've ever tried yeah. to do pillage at night, you can't see anything that's going on behind you really in, in all reality, especially if there's any type of dust. Like you have to kind of almost turn back on the pass you did to know if it looked good. And um, I think with some of the sensing capabilities that we're investing in, that that'll that'll be really impactful. And so, you know, you, it's kind of an incremental uh, step-by-step process to solve some of these challenges, but um, they're definitely solvable, which is exciting. Right on. Okay. Well, I know we only have a couple of minutes left. I know you got a hard stop coming up here. Um, <clears throat> final thoughts on this, Colin? As you take a look, what's going on here? What's what? What do you? Kind of what do you see coming at us, and and how how do you how you should we if I'm an if I'm an end user how should I prepare my my farm for uh, what's coming? Well, it's a great question. I mean, there's a lot of things coming. Um, there's a lot of investment in the space. There's a lot of different companies working on different aspects of the challenges for for autonomy. I think the key thing is to really understand what what is the ROI. And, and clarify that before you make any type of decision. Make sure you understand like how how can you use it and um, save 
actual cost. Um, and there's there's a lot of factors that go into that for any given operation. I think it's it's going to depend. But if you if you can hand off or repurpose labor, um, you know that's that's the most direct way to do it. It's the most tangible way to pencil ROI. Um, but it's also not probably going to be in the end of the day the biggest value proposition. Um, so it's harder to do the math on safety. Um, but to me, that's one of the things that maybe doesn't get talked about enough related to autonomy. If you look at, you know, the most dangerous jobs in the world, there, there's like crab fishermen and then there's like farmers, right? Right, right, <laughs> yeah. So yeah. It's like, yep. um, it, it's, it's dangerous and, it, and it's obvious why, right? You're putting human beings in extremely close proximity of very high horsepower machinery that, that can kill you in an instant. And, and so the more that we can do as an industry to even just create um, distance between people and machinery is going to pay dividends, right? And mm -hmm. it's hard to put a value on saving somebody's life or, or limb, but um, that's something also that really should be considered um, at, as a part of the decision-making metric or matrix um, when you're looking at this type of technology is can, can I create a safer environment for, for my workers and, and myself and my family um, by leveraging some of this? And it doesn't always have to be full autonomy, right? I mean, I don't think, I think that's the fun kind of sexy part to talk about, but there's a lot of like basic things you can do with this technology that, that isn't going to mean like day one, you're saving an operator um, mm -hmm. time, right? It, it might just mean, hey, you're able to supervise something remotely that you couldn't before. Right, right on. Well, Colin, I appreciate you being on the podcast, man. If folks want to reach out to you and get more information about what you're doing, what's the easiest way to do that? Yeah, just go on the website. It's um, mockmach.io, and you can you can drop us a line on there, and um, also look us up on LinkedIn or, or social media. We're, we've got some cool pictures and videos we put out there every once in a while. Some of the stuff we're working on. So, um, I always love to hear from end users that are looking at autonomy um, because that that does help us as we talk to different OEMs, you know, mm -hmm. understanding in practical reality, what it is you're trying to do as a farmer um, is, is very valuable for us to, to talk to some of our OEM partners about and say, Hey, look, you've got this machine. Here's this, here's this need. Let's put the two together. Yep. Right on. Okay. So, well, Connor, Colin, I appreciate it. Um, I'm Casey Seymour with Moving Iron Podcast. Check me on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at Moving Iron LLC. Go to LinkedIn at Moving Iron Podcast. Check out the YouTube version of this on the YouTube channel, which is Moving Iron Podcast YouTube channel. And go to MovingIronLLC.com for everything Moving Iron related. Colin, good to connect with you again, man. Glad you could come back on, and uh, I hope we, uh, hope we do this again sometime. Yeah. Thanks, Casey. Thanks for having me. All right. Appreciate it. Take care. Moving Iron Podcast is brought to you by these great sponsors. Are you looking to value your equipment more accurately? target the right buyers and close more deals, reach your ideal customer, then look no further. Fusible isn't just about ag data, it's about action. Our best-in-class solution empowers you to value your equipment accurately, make informed decisions, and find the perfect prospects. Ignite your dealership's growth at fusible.com slash moving iron dash podcast. Out in the field, every decision counts. You wouldn't plant without testing your soil, so why would you prospect blind? Introducing EDA, your one-stop shop for ag equipment intel. EDA goes beyond specs and prices. You get deep dive data on every piece of equipment like UCC filings that help track ownership changes and uncover potential sales leads. D&B firmographics, which help you understand the financial health and buying power of potential customers. Market trends that help you stay ahead of the curve and insights on equipment demands and pricings. With EDA, you're not just looking at data, you're seeing opportunity. Find the right buyer, sell smarter, and build lasting relationships. Visit edadata.com for your free demo and unlock the power of knowledge. For over 80 years, Iron Solutions has been your go-to data source for ag dealers, lenders, and manufacturers. Get powerful appraisal and value forecasting tools that fuel profitable decisions anytime, anywhere. Get your free demo at ironsolutions.com. Iron Solutions, confidence in every click. Today, there are many ways to finance ag equipment. 
but nobody delivers simple, fast, or flexible financing like AgDirect. Learn more about your options to buy, lease, and refinance equipment at agdirect.com. Valley Transportation has been hauling ag and construction equipment across the country for the past 33 years. Call Parker at 800-657-4910 for all your trucking needs. At Valley Transportation, our goal is to help you reach yours. This podcast is proudly provided by Axon, helping dealers move more iron for the past 100 years. Find out more at axontire.com. Move more iron with Axon. Moving iron in the 21st century.